welcome uh, Tara. She's here. Uh, she's uh, based at George Washington University. You'll hear a little bit more about the Wave Lab that she uh, runs there. Uh, and her subject tonight is obviously uh, something bringing together um, uh, the latest technology and, and something we're, we're aware of right now. But as, as she's going to say, it's uh, surveillance is, is not actually a new topic. And uh, we're, we're excited to, for her to give us a long view on what it has meant and what it will mean going forward. Please a big round of applause for Tara Barron. Hi everyone, well thank you for that introduction and thank you to the Long Now Foundation for inviting me to be here with you tonight. I'm really excited to talk to you about surveillance. I know this is a topic of the moment, um, I am scared about surveillance, I'm sure all of you are, but this is not a talk about being afraid, it's a talk about how organizations use surveillance and how that might affect individual behavior, both for bad and possibly for good. Uh, so before I get into the research I want to talk to you about today, let me just say a few words about who I am and what my perspective is. So I'm a psychologist. Psychology is the study of behavior, individual behavior. Uh, more specifically, I'm an organizational psychologist, which is the study of people in organizations. And we have two goals. The first goal is to maximize the well-being of individual human beings in organizations. I think that's a lofty goal. The second goal is to maximize the productivity of the organization as a whole. And we can think about organizations as including institutions like government agencies and educational institutions and nonprofits. So these are all the kinds of organizations that someone like me might work with. And we tend to follow this model of the scientist practitioner model, meaning our science is informed by what's actually happening in real organizations. And when we work with organizations, we use scientific best practice to inform how they should operate. I think the best way to understand the scientist practitioner model also sets up what I want to talk to you about today, which is surveillance. So this is a question that organizational psychologists have been thinking about for at least 100 years. The most famous example has come to be called the Hawthorne Studies. Okay. So the Hawthorne Electric Plant in Chicago was struggling with productivity. They said, why are our workers not being productive? And so they called in a few uh, management professors to come figure out what was going on. And the management professors took a look around and they said, well, it's really dim in here. Let's try raising the lighting. So they raised the lighting and productivity went up. It was amazing. They were so proud of themselves for figuring it out. But they said, we should be good scientists. Let's try a few more things. So let's raise the lighting again. Raise the lighting again. Productivity went up again. They said, all right, we figured it out. But let's just be sure. We'll lower the lighting and see what happens. So they lower the lighting. Productivity went up again. Oh, okay, so it's not about the lighting. This is what they could conclude, right? Instead, they realized, being good scientists, that perhaps the workers in this organization were not passive objects being observed, but perhaps they were aware that they were being observed and changing their behavior accordingly, right? And so whatever the explanation, maybe they were trying to help the experiment be successful. Maybe they were kind of happy that someone, some fancy Harvard Business School person was there observing them. Maybe they were just on their best behavior because somebody was watching. But regardless, we can conclude that people change their behavior when they're being watched. This should be a surprise to nobody. Right? Of course, people act differently when they're being watched. This is the first time that we observe this um, in this sort of context. Um, but of course, this question is much older than 100 years old. Right? We can go back and think about how philosophers have been exploring this question. Uh, we can go back as far as Plato. Um, in Plato's Republic, there's a story about a person named Gyges. Um, Gyges was a fellow who somehow obtained a ring that made him invisible. It was amazing. So he can do whatever he wants. And what did he do? Well, he killed the king, right? married the queen, used this, this power to um, behave quite evilly, or amorally at least. Um, and the reason this is in the Republic is it's a debate about what happens when people are not held accountable for their behavior, when they can do whatever they want. The argument here is that maybe we all act like evil animals when no one's watching us. I don't agree with that argument, of course, uh, but this is the kind of question that is being posed. Are we really moral, or does somebody need to watch us to make us be moral? 
Okay. This line of inquiry continued um, in, the, in the 1800s, Jeremy Bentham, um, and this is the panopticon here. Some of you are probably familiar with the idea of the panopticon. The idea is a hypothetical prison where you can't tell if the guard is watching you or not. So you always have to be on your best behavior just in case the guard is watching you. Right? So you don't even need real surveillance, you just need the possibility of surveillance, and you will then behave properly. Okay? Um, common to both of these arguments is the idea that the point of surveillance is to make people behave. Okay? But that's not the only way to think about surveillance. Um, around 1900, um, a psychologist named Triplett observed cyclists. And he noticed that when the cyclists were practicing for a race, they turned in faster times when they were racing with their buddies, and slower times when they were racing with their, by themselves. You've probably experienced something like this yourself. Yes, I see a lot of nodding. Right? Something about having the other people around you improves your performance. And Triplett called this idea social facilitation, but he didn't really know why it worked or what was going on. He just knew that people's performance was better when they were surrounded by their friends. And so for the next 50 years, psychologists tried to figure out what was going on here. And they ran all sorts of different experiments to try to replicate this effect of social facilitation. And sometimes performance went up when other people were around, sometimes it went down, sometimes nothing happened, and it was very confusing. Okay? Um, around the 60s, a psychologist, a social psychologist named Bob Zion showed up and gave some real clarity to this, to this phenomenon. So Bob Zion proposed what he called drive theory, which is that the effects of having people around you, watching you, depend on what you're doing, what task you're doing. Okay? If you're doing a simple task, like six minus one, who knows the answer to that one? <laughs> okay, yes, uh, that's easy. Having other people around makes it even easier. Okay? But when you're doing a complex task, like this one, who knows this one? <laughs> Nobody, huh? Um, then the, the effect of having people around you is negative. So we can say that the social, the, the people observing you, enhance whatever your dominant response is. If your dominant response is success, you get more successful. If it's failure, then you get more terrible. Um, if any of you are athletes or you know, if you shoot pool in a bar, you know that if you're good at something, having people around you makes you even better. Right? It kind of gives you that stimulation. But if you're bad at it, then the people around you make it even harder to focus because it's a source of distraction. Okay? So this is what we know, generally speaking, about social facilitation currently. But I'm interested in electronic surveillance. Right? What's different when the thing watching you is not your buddy, but a computer or a device of some sort? So electronic surveillance is different for a lot of reasons. Four of them are up here. Um, one is that it's focused just on you. Okay? The crowd can be looking at all sorts of things, not necessarily focusing on the person but electronic surveillance tends to focus only on the individual performing. Um, it's invisible, you have to wonder, and so here is that panopticon effect again. You don't know if you're being watched or not. This is a problem. Um, it's permanent, meaning if your boss is watching you at work, they're not documenting everything they observe and filing it away, but electronic surveillance does create a permanent record, and so it's potentially more threatening to you. And then finally, it's continuous. Electronic surveillance doesn't take a bathroom break. Right? So for all of these reasons, um, it's possible that electronic surveillance behaves differently than um, individual human being surveillance. Okay. Um, the other difference that's really important when it comes to electronic surveillance is not how you're being watched, but what is being watched. It's not just your body, but perhaps your thoughts. Right? Your email contains your your intimate thoughts, um, what you say and how you say it, it gets more into the psychological and less into the physical. A good example of this is uh, something called a sociometric badge. This is something that was originally developed in the MIT Media Lab and has now been spun off into um, a profit-making enterprise. This is a device you wear around your neck, and it tracks what you say and how you say it, what's the emotional tone of what you're saying. Um, and so it's, it's potentially very useful as a feedback tool. The real power, though, is that everyone on your team wears it, too. And so now I can track who you talk to, who you interrupt, right? Who's talking the most? There's always one team with a chatterbox, right? Who's the chatterbox? Um, and I can really get rich information about what the social dynamics are in a team. 
Um, the danger, though, is taking this descriptive information and making it prescriptive. Right? Imagine that I learn something about my team and I say, this is amazing. Janet always speaks first. That's the magic formula. Let's make Janet speak first at every meeting and for every team. Well, of course, that's faulty logic. Right? But this is the kind of logic that surveillance tends to encourage. Um, so my point with all of this is that electronic surveillance is a very important cue about what's important, and it drives people's behavior and changes it accordingly. This could be good or it could be bad, depending on what we're surveilling. Uh, those of you that are economists or have a background in economics might have heard of Goodhart's Law. Yes, this is the same principle, that when you measure something and try to use it as a target, it's no longer a good measure. And I'll give you an example of this that might resonate with you. Who has a Fitbit? Anyone have a Fitbit? Or something similar, it counts your steps? Okay, the idea is that uh, we know from research that people who take more steps are healthier, right? This is, this is true. So let's make everyone take more steps, and then they'll be healthier, right? No, because who's ever been tempted to put your Fitbit on your dog to <laughs> right, increase your steps? or to um, eat a cheeseburger because you met your steps for that day, right? So it's great at focusing your attention on just that one thing, but you lose the whole picture, right? That's the effect of counting something. Narrow the attention on just that thing, right? That's the real problem. Um, I'm gonna say the same thing I just said, but say it in terms of, <laughs> uh, say it in terms of psychology and goal setting. Okay, so let's assume this is you. I'm not saying this is you, but just pretend it's you for a moment. Um, and let's say you've got a goal to become healthier, right? So you're going to take up cycling. So motivation is the force that drives your effort and your persistence towards that idea of becoming healthier. And the goal is that desired future state, whatever it is. It could be win a race. It could be um, be healthier. It could be look good in my cycling outfit. Right? Um, these goals are not necessarily all in sync with each other, and the goal that you choose is really important. Okay? Um, since the 90s, we've been talking about... I wish this was my joke, by the way, but um, it is not. <laughs> so, um, since the 90s, we've been talking about the potentially negative consequences of over-enthusiastic goal setting. So Max Bezerman um, deserves credit for this uh, joke, goals gone wild, but the idea is that goals are so effective that they make you do all kinds of unethical and crazy things in the service of meeting that goal. Um, a good example from the 70s is the Ford Pinto, right? Ford said, make me a car that costs under $2,000 and weighs under 2,000 pounds, and the Ford said, you got it. But they forgot to say, don't make it blow up, right? <laughs> um, same thing in 2015, right? Volkswagen had some very clear goals about emission standards, and they figured out the best way was to just lie about it. Okay, so goals are great at achieving that very specific behavior that you set, but at the cost of long-term thinking, at the cost of ethical thinking, at the cost of considering people who are not you, right? So this is the downsides of goal setting. And again, electronic surveillance is a very effective goal setting mechanism, right? Whatever you're measuring becomes the goal. Um, to get even more precise for you, and this is um, a lot of jargon, so bear with me, uh, we can think about the kinds of goals that somebody might set and categorize them according to a two-by-two two matrix. Um, first, we can think about goals as either being positive or negative. Um, approach goals, positive goals, mean get something good, right? Win a prize, learn a skill, do something amazing. Avoid goals mean avoid something bad. Right, like run away from a bear would be a void goal. Um, or not look foolish in front of the cute guy or girl in your study hall. Right? Avoiding bad things is a totally legitimate kind of goal. We can also organize them according to whether they are learning focused or performing focused. Another way of saying that is, are you trying to really get better or are you trying to seem better? Are you trying to impress people or are you trying to really develop something in yourself? Okay. Um, unfortunately, surveillance tends to encourage performance goals, uh, which are useful in some contexts, but really problematic in other contexts. Okay. Um, this matters to me for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it matters, though, and sorry for the gruesome image here, um, is that in the context of organizations, people need to learn new skills all the time. 
right? They need to be okay with not being amazing the first time they try something. If you're a medical resident learning to perform knee surgery, uh, you can't be worried about how many seconds it takes you to perform the surgery the first time. You can't be worried about whether you're outperforming your buddy. You have to really focus on mastering that skill at first. And the problem with surveillance is that it makes that goal less likely to happen. Has anyone ever heard of the term personalized learning or adaptive learning or any of these ideas? All of these educational innovations are based on the premise that we collect a lot of data about people and then use it to give them feedback, right? To help them improve their performance. But the data collection itself makes it less likely that the educational innovation will be successful because you're focusing the attention on the thing being measured and then driving the behavior away from what you want. Okay. So overall, I would say that, listen, surveillance is a form of goal setting for people. It says, pay attention to this information. It's really important because I'm counting it so you know it's really important. That can be good or it can be bad, depending on what you're counting. However, and this is a huge however, in fact, I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes with this however, um, not all people are equal and not all surveillance is equal. So I wanna present two studies to you, one to argue the first point, one to argue the second point, about how different people might react to surveillance and how surveillance itself can be framed in such a way as to be more or less problematic. All right, so I'm gonna start with the first one, not all people are equal. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question. So imagine that you're in your workplace and there has been a rash of thefts. Someone's stealing something. You can invent the thing, it's okay. Uh, and the management says, we're gonna install surveillance cameras to use some facial recognition and see you know, who the thief is and we'll keep that information on record and we might pull it up in a couple of years to do something with it or not, I don't know, we'll see. Um, would you be okay with that? So your, your answers can be yes, no, or it depends. Who thinks, yes, this is acceptable? <laughs> Who thinks, no, it is completely unacceptable? Who thinks it depends on something? Okay, interesting. So the Pew Center for Internet and Society conducted this exact survey, um, and their responses were a little bit different, but the point stands, which is that your answer to this question varies. Not everyone feels the same way about whether this is acceptable. Um, in an interview study that I conducted, I found the same thing. So I want to show you a few quotes. I asked people how they felt about the surveillance that existed in their organizations. Um, so this quote is from somebody who is not monitored at all in their organization. And you can see that they said, it upsets me that no one monitors anything. It says they don't care. It's really frustrating. I think productivity would go way up if somebody monitored something. Right? Like I'm just making up reports just in the blind attempt that someone will pay attention to me. Okay, so that's one response. Um, the second response is, yeah, it's cool that no one monitors me because I, I think my boss understands the digital age, understands that it's unreasonable to track people's internet usage, so this is a reasonable um, behavior. So two people, both not monitored, very different reactions. Now this person is monitored. And they said, you know what, it drives me crazy. I can't stand the fact that there might be nothing to do at work, there's no customers, but some security guy somewhere is watching me, right? That makes me insane. Um, I would feel that way too. Contrast that with this person who says, you know what? I've seen surveillance used effectively to resolve issues. I think it's great. We should surveil more. Uh, so this tells me people feel differently about this issue, okay? So the question is, why do they feel differently about this issue? What can we learn about people that might suggest why they react to surveillance in a particular way? And the way that we come at this question might depend on your perspective. So if you're an economist, I love economists, I don't know why I pick on them so much. Um, if you're an economist, you might take a kind of privacy calculus perspective. You might say that people are okay giving up some information about themselves as long as they get something in return. Right? So we saw that person who said, I've seen it used to resolve issues, so I'm fine with it. I can, I can be okay with this practice. Uh, you might take a different perspective, though. You might take a perspective of values, and um, even saying the word authoritarian makes me feel slightly bad these days, but uh, if you're an authoritarian, you tend to support surveillance, right? For the same reason that the philosophers were talking about, to enforce good behavior. You might feel like people need to be surveilled or they'll act out. 
Um, if you're a collectivist, collectivists tend to value the welfare of the group over their own individual welfare. They tend to think about their identity as part of a group identity, which means their own individual information is actually not so precious that they need to protect it. And so collectivists might actually care less about individual privacy as long as it supports the group. Okay? Um, I'm, those are great. I'm actually interested in personality as a predictor. So I want to present to you some research that I did about how people's personalities might drive how they react to surveillance. Okay. Um, just as a refresher, in case you're not a personality psychologist, um, just in case, the, um, the dominant model of, of personality research is the Big Five model, also called the Ocean model. Um, and we can think about these five variables. You can be high or low on either of them. You don't have to pick a variable. Right? Being open doesn't mean you're not an extrovert. Uh, and just quickly, open-mindedness tends to refer to how receptive you are to new ideas. So people who are high in openness, they like to go to art museums, um, they like to think, they tend to vote for liberal political candidates. This is open-mindedness. Um, conscientiousness has to do with rules and orderliness. So if your closet looks like this, you're probably conscientious. Um, if you're very punctual, if you, if you care a lot about order, you're conscientious. Extroversion has to do with liking to be around other people, liking to be social. So if you like to go to parties, if you find that your best ideas come from talking to other people, that's extroversion. Um, agreeableness is, is kindness and, and compassion. So it's different than being around other people. Um, you can be a jerk and like to be around other people to yell at them all the time, right? But agreeableness is more about um, actually caring about them. Um, and then neuroticism has to do with the tendency to experience negative emotions. So if you experience stress very easily, if things bother you very easily, that's neurotic. It's not a judgment statement. It's actually <laughs> all of these, <laughs> yes. Um, all of these can be bad in uh, either extreme, and so you shouldn't feel um, any you shouldn't feel any stress if you're neurotic. Is what I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so this is the Big Five model of personality. In addition to this Big Five model, there's another variable that's important to understand, which is called impression management. Everybody engages in impression management sometimes. If you're on a job interview, if you're on a date, the impression management means attempting to put forward a good impression to make someone else like you. So we all do it sometimes. Uh, people vary, however, in how much they do it. So some people always are concerned about putting forward a good face and impressing others and doing what everyone else is doing. So if you have a habit of kind of reading the room before you act, right, that's impression management. Other people really don't care. They do what they want. Right? And they figure, so what if people don't like me? So then you'd be low in impression management. Okay. So this is not a sixth personality variable, but rather it tells us how likely it is that you display your real personality, depending on the situation. Right? If you're high in impression management, you might be likely to kind of withhold that. Okay. All right, so to understand how this personality um, patterns might affect surveillance, um, perceptions. I use data from the mypersonality.org project. Um, the My Personality Project is a Facebook app that was active from 2009 to 2012. Some of you might have downloaded it. Six million people did. Um, and if you downloaded this app, it asked you a series of questions. The first thing it did is say, take a personality test. And we'll give you your feedback, and it will be wonderful, and you'll know what your personality is. The second thing it said is, by the way, can we see your Facebook profile just to give you more information about your uh, personality? So this is the first um, kind of privacy variable that I was able to obtain. Did you agree to share your profile with some stranger on the internet just because they asked? Uh, and then the third step is that the app captured any profile photos that you made available um, publicly. Okay, so uh, you know it was a different it was a different time, 2009, and so it, that question made more sense before. Uh, but the idea is any po any photos that you set to public, the app would just collect. Okay, so this is another measure of how much you care about privacy. All right, so let me show you what this uh, what this data yielded. The first thing is shocking to me actually, which is that most people said, "Sure, you can see my Facebook profile." Um, in, in 2009, almost 70% of people said yes. In 2010, about 50% of people said yes. 
Um, so I, the rest of the analyses here then focus on 2010, when about half of people said yes, half people said no. There's about a million people um, in this data set. All right. Um, so before I get to personality, the first thing I looked at, perhaps the most obvious thing, was whether there were gender and age effects in whether people shared their data. Um, and this was a surprise to me, but there was not any major age effects. You can see that um, 18 to 24 year olds were the most likely to share, but they were followed by 35 to 44 year olds. So for the most part, people are equally willing to share their information depending on their age. Um, and as far as gender, there's a small but consistent effect of gender in that men are slightly more likely to share than women, but this is not a dramatic effect. We're talking less than five percentage points. Uh, so, without further ado, personality. Uh, so, I wanted to look at, again, whether personality variables predicted whether people would share their data with a random stranger on the internet. Uh, and the data is pretty interesting here. So, the first thing we observe here is that conscientious people care more about their privacy, which makes sense. They care about rules. They're cautious. They shouldn't share with strangers. Um, and open-minded people care less about privacy. They're open, right? They like to share things. So, so far, pretty logical. Um, it's also noteworthy that impression managers, again, those are people who are trying to impress you, um, cared the least about privacy, right? So they're, they're sharing the most with you. And I'll come back to why I think that's really important in a moment. But this is just one variable. I also looked at whether their photo was public, remember? And when I looked at that, the pattern was totally different. So uh, open-minded people now care more about privacy. Conscientious people care less about privacy. Um, and now agreeableness and extroversion show up for the party too. Uh, and so depending on the kind of privacy behavior we're interested in, the predictors are different. That's important. All privacy is not the same, right? People make this decision on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what's being asked of them. And there's something different about giving your profile to a person who asked for it versus putting a photo out there into the world for anyone to see, right? The predictors of those two behaviors are totally different. This is not surprising. Uh, so I wanted to keep looking at this, this, this idea, this pattern. The next way I looked at this data was by grouping people into theoretically meaningful categories based on their whole personality profile at once. So the first um, category, conspiracy theorists, Conspiracy theorists are defined by being very high in openness, meaning they're willing to entertain new ideas, even if they're perhaps a little on the conspiracy side. Um, and they tend to be highly neuroticism, meaning they get stressed out and nervous easily. So if you get stressed out and nervous easily, and you're very, very open-minded, that happens to be the kind of person that believes in conspiracies. <laughs> Doesn't mean that any individual person is a conspiracy theorist, but this is, this is the, the pattern. The second pattern is impression managers, and I, I categorize this a little bit differently here. Here, impression managers are people who told me that they have every positive trait and no negative traits. Right? So if you said, I'm just an amazing, wonderful person in every way, you're a liar, um, and you're an impression manager. Okay? So, so that, those are the two categories that I was really most interested in. I thought, you know, I thought that conspiracy theorists would be more concerned about privacy and impression managers would be less concerned about privacy. Um, and then the third category is everyone else. I don't care about them. <laughs> so, so it turns out that I was partially right. If I looked at how many profile images people made available, there was no difference in people's personalities. But if I looked more closely at the photos and checked to see if there was a face in them, like are you actually showing your face or is it just a cartoon cat, right? Well, the impression managers are more likely to show their face and the conspiracy theorists are less likely to show their face. Okay, so pretty consistent with what we would expect. Okay, so as far as answering this question, does personality predict sharing or does it predict attitudes about privacy? Um, the, I think the biggest take home is that impression management absolutely does predict sharing and there are a few different contrasting explanations for why that might be. The first one is that I've scrubbed my profile so carefully because I'm trying to impress everyone that sharing doesn't matter. There's nothing terrible in there, right? So who cares? Let everyone see it. The, the other explanation is that someone has asked something of me and I want them to like me, so I give them my data, right? A third explanation, and this is, I confess to wildly speculating at this point, um, a third explanation is that um, 
when I'm high in impression management, who I am changes based on the situation, right? So sharing it doesn't really matter. Like, I don't feel very closely connected to that thing that I'm sharing. And so it has less value for me. This is almost an economic argument again, that my, my personal information has less value, so I'm willing to give it to someone who asks. And I can't tell you based on this data which of those explanations is the most true or if any of them are true, but this is what I suspect. Okay. Um, now I want to go back. Remember, I started off by saying that not all people are equal and not all surveillance is equal. So now I want to return to that second point, not all surveillance is equal. And I want to show you an experimental study I conducted to explore how characteristics of the surveillance itself might affect how it, change, how it um, affects people's behavior. Um, and specifically, I looked at how the surveillance is framed and communicated to people. Okay? Now, if we think back to our personalized learning and adaptive learning kinds of examples, those also use surveillance, right? We can frame surveillance as, we're watching you to check up on you because we think you're terrible and need to be babysat. Or we can frame it as, we're collecting personalized information to give you a better experience of some sort, right? Those have very different feelings. One is Big Brother, and one is Microsoft Clippy, here to help you, <laughs> right? So one is threatening, one is not threatening. Um, even though the behavior is the same and the surveillance is the same. So I explored these two frames in the context of people learning how to use advanced Microsoft Excel functions, VLOOKUP, pivot tables, things like this. So we asked them to come in to an experiment, learn how to use pivot tables, which who doesn't love a good pivot table? And, and then we told them we're monitoring you, and we gave them one of these two frames, either to make sure you do everything you're supposed to or because we're trying to give you a better experience. Um, and so we showed them this fake report that showed all the things that would be collected about them. You know, the details of this are not important. And then we asked them to engage in a video test. Um, it had clearly in red letters that we're monitoring you to remind people. And then at the end of each module, they completed a little test, like what symbol do you use to refer to a different worksheet? So it's a little declarative knowledge test. And, and then it's, it's small to see, but what you can see is that it says, you spent 75 seconds on this video, you should have spent 180 seconds, so go back, watch that video again. Okay, and this is one of the behaviors that we were interested in. Do people go back and watch the video again? Um, and then at the very end of the training, they did a skills test. So we gave them a worksheet and said, use some pivot tables on this worksheet to solve some problems. All right, so we have some different learning outcomes based on, again, that declarative knowledge test, the behavior, and the final skills test. And we had three conditions. We had people who were not monitored at all, people who were monitored developmentally, and people who were monitored kind of evaluatively, administratively. All right, so here's, here's the results. Um, the first set of graphs there, the declarative knowledge test, no differences. So as far as those little checkup tests they took throughout, uh, it didn't matter whether they were monitored or not, they performed about the same. But if you look at the final skills test, you see that people who were monitored developmentally performed a full point better than people who were not monitored. So their performance was noticeably better. Um, and if you look at how long they spent reviewing the task, right? people who were monitored developmentally spent twice as long reviewing the task as people who were monitored administratively. Um, so again, I, you know, I started off by talking about how monitoring can focus people's goals in a very particular way. Um, well, that also depends on how it's framed and how it's communicated to people. We can achieve very useful learning outcomes um, with a very simple kind of framing manipulation. I also asked people what they thought about this training experience. Uh, and so I asked them first, how useful did this training seem to you? Did you feel like you got something out of it? People who were monitored developmentally felt like it was marginally more useful. I asked them, how fair did it seem that we tracked your behavior? People who were monitored developmentally felt like it was marginally more fair. And then I asked them, did you feel like your privacy was invaded? First thing to notice is that nobody felt like their privacy was very invaded. Right? So on a scale of one to five, they were about as low as you could be. But the people with administrative monitoring felt like it was more of an invasion of privacy. Okay, uh, so just to wrap up and, and highlight some really important conclusions from this set of studies, 
Um, there's an old expression in organizational psychology, which is what you measure is what you treasure. Meaning, by putting a number on something, you give it importance, and then it drives future behavior. This is a serious problem if you measure the wrong thing. And we usually measure the wrong thing because it's easier. Right? So you just count whatever's laying around, and then all of a sudden it takes on all sorts of importance. Um, what I would argue for is using theory to support appropriate data collection. Um, it's also very clear from these studies and others that I haven't presented today that measurement directs the goals of the people that's being measured. And so if you direct the goals in the wrong direction, you'll have some problems. Uh, we know that measurement can be a source of distraction. Um, in a, in a, another study I ran around um, online interviews, I uh, took the little picture of yourself that shows up in a Skype interview, right? And I either had it there or took it away. And just that little stimulus of someone can see you, right? All of a sudden people are messing with their hair a little bit more, right? They're a little bit distracted and their performance on the interview went down because of this extra source of distraction. It doesn't take much. Right? We're, we're fragile human beings. We only have so much attention. And measurement is a source of distraction. But not all people are affected the same way, and not all measurement has the same effects. And the last thing I would say is that when I hear security experts talking about surveillance, they say things like, you have to be smart about privacy. Right? You have to be smart. And then you read things like, Oh, well, all the privacy policies that you encounter in a year would take you 76 days to read. And nobody knows what a privacy policy is, and they've never heard of it, and they don't know how to understand it. Right? This suggests that if we just had all the information, we would make these wonderfully perfect decisions, but that's not how humans work. Right? We have motivations, we have goals, we have preferences. And in the studies that I presented to you, people made an informed decision about sharing or not sharing, being surveilled or not being surveilled, and it doesn't mean they're not smart, right? So I would like to argue for a slightly more nuanced way of thinking about privacy and surveillance based on the fact that we are humans with agency and can make decisions. Um, the, I think the study that puts the finest point on that last argument is one of my favorites. I can't take any credit for it. Uh, it was a study of college students. And so they interviewed a bunch of college students and they said, should you, if you receive a link from an anonymous person, should you click on it? And 75% of people said, oh, no, no. Do not click on that link. And then the same researchers emailed the same college students and said, check out these pictures from last night with a fake link. And you know what? Everyone clicked on that link. <laughs> Everyone did. Right? And it's because we're making a decision. What if there's cool pictures in there? Right? What if, what if there's an embarrassing picture in there and I need to verify it? This is a logical decision on the part of the college students. And so, again, it's not about being smart. Um, so thank you to my collaborators here, and I look forward to your questions. And uh, there we are. Good. Um, <laughs> so um, we're, we're going to take questions uh, from, from the audience. I may need to hand you this mic to do it. So think of your questions. Um, one thing, um, we chatted a little bit about this earlier. So as you were talking about that Facebook app and that experience, um, there was something in the news. I don't know if anybody read a, a, a Guardian article that had to do with the Trump uh, mm -hmm. campaign's data uh, side this weekend, but there's, there's sort of a relation here. Maybe you can talk about what, uh, how some of that data relates to and is not uh, the, the, yes. the data that appears in the Trump sure. campaign. Uh, so to clarify, I'm not funded by Robert Mercer or Breitbart. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> hope that was obvious because I don't have horns. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, um, right, so, um, yeah, some of you might have read about this story about Cambridge Analytica, which is a marketing company. And the premise of this organization is to use the same kind of Facebook data that I presented to um, give people ads that are personalized to their personality and therefore manipulate and change their behavior. And you, perhaps you can tell from my tone, I'm highly skeptical about the effectiveness of this approach. Uh, but you, 
it's along the lines of if you're extroverted, I'll show you an ad with lots of people having fun at a party. And if you're introverted, I'll show you an ad with one person reading a book. Or if you're neurotic, I'll show you a picture of like a person with a gun coming to shoot you so that you're scared. Right? There's very little evidence that people are so easily manipulated. Um, so I would, I would point that out, that this is not you know, the AI coming to brainwash you that everyone seems to think it is. Um, it's, I, I heard a great talk last uh, week from a friend of mine, Jeff Hancock, who pointed out that in the 30s, everyone was afraid of subliminal advertising, right, brainwashing you. Um, but I'm pretty sure we didn't turn into a nation of the, well, maybe we did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it, this is a, a progression of something that has been um, kind of in our minds for a long time. As far as the connection of the data itself, um, it is similar data, but not the same data. And the data that I presented to you is collected for research purposes only, and it's actually public data, and so anyone who would like to can um, obtain it if they like. Um, and we have, so, so Rio's gonna be taking your question, so uh, catch her eye if you want to ask a question. And while she's finding somebody, I have one from the live stream I uh, didn't mention. Thanks everybody who's listening on the live stream. Um, so this is someone who, uh, first of all, like the talk a lot, and has worked in, um, uh, like telemarketing, so phone center things, where there's all kinds of data that's being collected in, in those kinds of environments. And they're asking the question, have you looked at, uh, at, at that? So, mm -hmm. and, and maybe this points to, so, so I don't know if you've got, worked with that data specifically, but maybe you wanna talk a bit about how you look at how um, organizations, businesses, as they're interacting with their employees more directly, some of, some of the work that you've done um, in, in that area, is that? Um, sure, so I think that's yeah. two different questions and yeah. I'll answer both of them. Yeah. Um, as far as whether anyone has looked at call centers which are pervasively monitored, um, absolutely. In fact, a lot, of the, a lot of the research in the early 2000s exploring whether electronic surveillance was similar to in-person surveillance um, that data was all collected from call centers because everything you do when you work in a call center is tracked and heavily regulated. Um, and we do see social facilitation effects occur. Um, I've talked to people from all sorts of organizational backgrounds and the same kinds of dynamics show up everywhere. Um, about 25% of the people in a recent study I conducted were monitored pervasively. So it's not just call centers. It's, it's actually not limited by job complexity either. In fact, people who are uh, lawyers and doctors and professors are also monitored pervasively. And you know, if you've got a ID tag with an RFID chip, right, and your locations are tracked, that counts. Um, so absolutely. Um, your other question, as far as the organizations I work with and, and how this comes up, you know, I started off by saying that not all surveillance is bad, and I really do believe that. Um, I work with a lot of government agencies, NGOs, who are interested in problems like workforce readiness and skills development for their most vulnerable citizens. And you can use big data and you can use surveillance to help people develop skills. Right? So I don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater here because I've seen it used really effectively um, with respect for individuals and respect for autonomy. I think that is possible. I think we've got a question over here. There you go. It strikes me that there might be a difference between surveillance where I know who is surveilling me in the workplace, for example, mm -hmm. and surveillance where I kind of know I'm being watched, but I don't know who's surveilling me, maybe on the internet. How do people mm -hmm. react or do they react differently in those situations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in another study I, I conducted recently, um, I, I was interested in the people who don't know how they're surveilled, and that's actually the worst outcome. So knowing who's monitoring you and for what purpose, people can be okay with that. Right? They can understand that and, and adapt to it. But wondering, having a lack of transparency is an incredible threat to our sense of justice. And it also doesn't inform us about how to behave at all. And so we're left in this state of wondering and, and uncertainty that's very bad for well-being. Yeah, and I, I'm sure we all feel that right now. Yes. Right there. Yeah, th thank you for a very interesting talk. I, I was really intrigued by the study of uh, connections between the personality traits and uh, one's opinions about surveillance. I was wondering, have you and your team, your lab, or anyone else in, in your field done a study where connections between one's 
uh, sort of moral foundations and opinions about morality or, uh, sorry, opinions about surveillance or uh, answers to these situations about uh, surveillance have been measured. Like, I'm thinking more of the works of like people like Richard Schroeder and, and Jonathan Haidt on foundations and uh, moral foundations of uh, mm -hmm. psychology. I do think your values have a lot to do with how you react to um, surveillance. The relationship between values and personality is kind of up for debate. Um, and I chose to focus on personality, but I could have easily also looked at values. Again, if you're an authoritarian in your value system, right, then the way you think about morality is driven by that. And so you'll be more okay with surveillance. Although this is an emerging area and I, I couldn't cite you any um, really great studies on the topic. I've got one over here. Um, I'm curious as to how you feel about the idea of surveillance. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if one of the directions that we're going is more and more surveillance to a point where everyone's watching everybody and the amount of directions are kind of untrackable at some point of all surveillance all the time, um, are there, where, where does that kind of limit start ending in, in social interaction? And if it's so prevalent, does it all stop mattering again? It's a great question. And um, as far as surveillance, which is the idea of, you know, surveillance means someone with power overseeing someone without power. Surveillance is the other direction, right? Someone without power or keeping an eye on the watchers. Um, and so we are seeing more technologies built to do just that. Um, the other part of your question as far as how that means we might change the way we think about what's private and public, I think that's a, a really important thing to think more about, um, how our identities change when there is nothing left to really hide. I personally think, and I don't have any data for this, I personally think being able to keep some things private is really important and valuable, um, and it shapes your identity, but um, in terms of data, I can't offer you any. And um, before we take the next question, so you're working, as you're part of your CASBIS fellowship, you're working on a book right now uh, about this. Do you want, you want to say uh, a thing or two about, is this at the center of it? Is this all that's in there? What's, what's the scope of the project you're working on right now? Um, sure. So, yes, this eventually will turn into a book within the next 20, 30 years or so. Um, uh, Are you taking down payments now? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, I, I uh, do accept advances. In terms of, right? um, so it will be about this research that I've conducted about how people react to surveillance, but also how we can use it to accomplish really important um, societal goods. Um, the other thing I'm working on at CASBIS that I do want to mention is that I'm part of a partnership with the CASBIS and the Stanford Cyber Initiative, which is an organization um, meant to help understand the intersections between social systems and cyber systems. I mean, I'm a psychologist, and that's very clear from my perspective. I, I think a lot of these questions are not about the technology, but about the people, about the psychology. So the point of this year is to help foster those connections even more. Um, and, and there are lots of interesting activities happening with the cyber initiative around those themes. Yeah. One in the back. Um, I was going to mention, um, I think there might be a third modality that you were, that we haven't addressed when it comes to whether it's your employer surveying what you're doing as part of your job and someone surveying in terms of offering you offers that are things that are useful to you. The third one is we're just collecting all of the data because we don't know what we want to use it for, but we're just going to point a bunch of, uh, you know, big data at it and figure out in the mm -hmm. future what those things mean. And, and there seems to be a very big risk of of making conclusions about people that aren't necessarily true and, and that it's based on, you know, obviously whoever's studying something will look at the data and say, this proves this thing. And um, there's a hell of a lot of that stuff going on right now, especially with like the NSA snooping and just basically gathering everything. Right, right. Um, you're absolutely right. And this is again, an extension of the Goodhart's Law idea that just because we observe a pattern doesn't mean that that pattern will be useful in the future. And we have very little understanding of what those patterns really mean. Um, there's a lot of great examples of this, and I, I won't run through all of them, but um, in the context of organizations, we have algorithms that make hi dis hiring decisions, right? Who to hire, who not to hire, based on whoever's currently in the organization. And it turns out a lot of those algorithms are racist, right? Like, they're just terrible. Um, and the danger is having the data, assuming that you know what it means, and then extrapolating to the future, 
especially when the data, as we just saw, changes people's behavior, right? So we know that it's biased in a very particular direction. I think you're right, a lot of people are just grabbing as much data as they can with the hope of either monetizing it later or finding a pattern later, and I think that's really dangerous. Um, you've touched on examples of where the surveillance has a benefit and where I think it was just touched on very briefly was where there were was community training. I thought you said uh, where groups were brought together and they needed to learn something together. I, I, it's a bad example I can see from your face, but where, would you just touch on where, uh, elaborate on uh, examples of where surveillance has had a positive payoff uh, and what that payoff is and how did it come about? Um, sure, so I, I think um, maybe what you're referring to is the early social facilitation research about um, having a group of people around you enhancing your performance. That could be, but I was, mm -hmm. I was thinking, of, is, are there cases out there where the surveillance is generating value and we're better off because we've got this feedback of openness, mm -hmm. clarity, transparency, but it's, it's all working in the right direction. And, and, and maybe one of the things to say is that surveillance itself as the term becomes very charged. So maybe it's, we're calling mm -hmm. it something else. Right, data uh, it's, it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so other cases where, and, and there's some of those in the workplace that would be examples, maybe you can talk about some right, of those. Right, right, so data collection for the purpose of providing some service, I think that's ubiquitous, and in the context of learning, uh, let's say I am a teacher and I have 300 students, and I, I have no way of intervening with a student before they're on the wrong course, right? But if I've got a lot of beha behavioral data about them early, and then a little dashboard pops up and says, hey, Janet is, on the wrong course, you should intervene, I can save that student from flunking out. That's really powerful. Um, the question is, is Janet okay with this, right? Are they, have they been informed about the fact that everything about their behavior is collected? And so um, it's not about the tool, it's not about the data, it's about the process, right? How is the data collected, but also how is it communicated to the person who's supposedly receiving a benefit from it? Uh, because I think a lot of the services we talk about that rely on data collection do offer a benefit. Some people think Facebook is an essential good, right? That, that we need Facebook and it relies on data collection. That decision, I think, is made on an individual basis about whether the service is valuable enough to give up the data. One of the things we haven't really touched on, are, are there any models where the surveillance happens and the person who is surveilled, who is recorded, gets to see that data or that recording? Because mm -hmm. it seems like that would be a model where people could see and, and, and react themselves to it, not just that somebody in the booth gets to like see everything you've been doing. Are, are, are there examples of those? There I are, think? and a great one is, uh, if anyone ever works from home, um, sometimes you're expected to be available on video camera just to make sure you're not doing your laundry for example, right? I totally do my laundry when I work from home. Anyway, um, and there will be a little light that shows up to say your boss is using your webcam and looking to see what you're up to, or even just that you're available on chat, right? That there's a little green button that says you're available. So there are these feedback mechanisms all over the place to say someone's potentially looking at you right now. Um, and generally people like that because again, it's worse to not know. In fact, across a number of studies I've conducted, it's very clear that the worst possible phenomenon is to have no idea what's going on. Um, and so if you are um, informed about what's being collected and you have an understanding about why it's being collected, people are generally okay with that. You can take it one level up and give people control over whether the camera's on, right? So in most cases, I can hit a little button when I need to be away from my desk and I'll turn the camera off and then I can turn it back on when I return. The fact that I have control over it is great. And most people never even use the button, but just knowing that the button's there is really nice. One other example that probably a lot of people have heard about and has gotten a lot of publicity is body cams on cops. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to, to say about that? Because I've, I've heard research there that's shown positive things happening, but I, I don't know, what's, what's, do, you, do you have a take on that? Has that been something you've looked at at all? Uh, yeah, so my perspective would be how it influences the police officers, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and good and bad, mm -hmm. 
Um, because as you know, they're highly manipulatable, right? So I can change the, my body angle so that whatever I'm doing that's bad is not on the camera. Um, I can turn it off at the crucial moment. Um, the cameras do change behavior, but um, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't mean that it changes it in a super positive way all the time, right? It just means that people will optimize whatever's on the camera, but they'll find all kinds of sneaky ways around it if they are the sneaky sort. Um, and there's some really interesting kind of ongoing research in that area. Um, the city of DC has got this great initiative. It's called the Lab, the Lab at DC, I believe. Um, and so they're running a huge study right now about police body cams, and I think that data will be out soon enough. Uh, we got one in the back there. You showed a graph from the Facebook study um, showing that people got less willing to share their information as the years went on. There was a big drop off in the first year, but then it kind of continued a little bit. Have you seen other studies that suggested that that trend continued and we're getting more sensitive to this sort of stuff? Um, it's a great question. I've not seen any other studies that show a similar pattern. Uh, but I think we can all hypothesize about why we saw the pattern that we did, which is that from 2009 to 2012, there was a lot of information coming out about the fact that we needed to start being more careful about what we put online. 2009 was still the Wild West, right? Who knows what was going on in 2009? Uh, but uh, the other factor in that data is that um, far fewer people completed the survey in 2012 than they did in 2010. So it's not necessarily 100% representative, that trend. Um, we've got a lot of interest here. So you have one there? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for a great talk. Um, from a long now perspective, taking it further back about 150 years, there was, you lived in small societies and, and everyone knew what was happening with you and mm -hmm. uh, even further back you didn't really have any walls inside of your home so everyone knew exactly what you were doing at all times. Have you made any like, thoughts and comparisons uh, on, on, from that perspective? Yeah, I think the idea of privacy actually only belongs to a very small moment in time, right? It didn't exist before, and it probably won't exist in the future, but it exists right now, and so we're thinking about it right now. Um, but that's a great point that, you know, small communities of people where everybody knows everything about each other, it's a form of social control, right? You can't act out because everyone will know about it, and your ten aunties will come yell at you, right? So, so that's absolutely the case, and you can think of online data as just another extension of that. All right, and, and I think that's going to be our last um, question for the night, but Terry, you're going to stick around. So uh, I know there are a few more questions. Please uh, definitely come up and, and get uh, Tara to answer them. Um, I want to, let's have a big round of applause for Tara. And, uh, oh, wow. Thank you. I'm going to give you a, a long now challenge going to thank you so much for, for speaking for us. Again, she's going to be here. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, please do stick around, talk to each other, talk to Tara, um, and um, do uh, come back and see us. We've got a lot more great talks coming up.